Great. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the September um, 2023 Plant Cell Webinar. Um, this month, we have three speakers, uh, Peijin, Jisa, and Justin, speaking on their research in the latest issue of the Plant Cell. Um, the topic is biomolecular condensate, which I actually find to be a very interesting topic. So I'm very excited about the webinar. Um, today, our host is Emilio Gutierrez Beltran, and I'll Turn this over to him in just a second. And our moderator is Sophie Hendricks. There's my cursor. Um, the reason for this, well, uh, uh oh, uh oh, <laughs> we're having a lag. There we go. Um, the reason for this uh, conversation today is because we're celebrating the focus issue on cell condensates, and you can find that online right now. It's the September 2023 20, issue of Plant Cell. Um, and, oh, I don't know why I have seemed to have a problem with my slides. Well, that's okay. One thing I wanted to say is feel free to email me, mwilliams at ASPB.org, if you have any problems, and we will post this recording on YouTube. There we go. And thank you to ASPB members. <laughs> right, enough of me. Let's turn this over to Emilio. Hello, everybody. Yes, uh, wait, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, wait, uh, now? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, now. Okay, my hello, everybody. Um, my, my job today is just a uh, Introduce the these focus issues on biomolecular condensate that has been published in the in the journal recently. This uh, this uh, focus issue has been edited uh, by Lucia Strade, Peter Bosco, and myself, and has published five different review, two in brief articles, one perspective, one breakthrough report, and five research articles. The cover image that we can see here in the image is from Adrian, that is from the Department of Molecular Science at SLE in Sweden. Now, uh, first of all, I want to dedicate a few minutes to uh, explain what are uh, biomolecular condensates. Wait, okay, no. Uh, biomolecular condensates are formed by proteins and molecules that include mRNA molecules and are assembled in response to environmental change. In the most of the case, it uh, has been described that uh, this condensate has two different phases, one uh, called diffuse phase and another condensate phase. And it, it, and it is in this phase, in the condensate phase, where, when we can observe the condensate in the micros microscope. The assembly of uh, biomolecular condensate is a process in which liquid-liquid phase separation takes place in the, in the most of the case. Has been uh, found to have been observed uh, uh, biomolecular formation of biomolecular condensate in, in different organelles on the plant cell. For example, has been observed a, a formation of a biomolecular condensate in the cytoplasm that included a processing body of granules in the chloroplast and in the nucleus. That including, includes, uh, for example, nuclear speckle, cajal bodies, photobody, or disimple. Uh, the research on biomolecular condensate has increased dramatically in the few, uh, in the few last years, uh, especially in plants. So we thought that now is the moment to release these focus issues in biomolecular condensates. And the, in, uh, in the, this unit, the plant cell is the best for that. So now I'm going to dedicate a few slides to summarize the article that has been described, has been published, sorry, has been published in the journal. The first slide, just uh, I summarize the review article that has been published. In the first one, Sterling Field and co-author has summarized the recent finding of uh, biomolecular condensate that appear in different stages of uh, development, in the plant development. Moreover, in this uh, review article, the, the, the author uh, show as well the advantage and advantage of uh, different techniques that have been used to uh, study biomolecular condensate in plants. In the second one, in the second review, Jorge Solis Miranda, um, an author, provide an overview of the assembly, molecular function, molecular properties, and biotechnological application of cytoplasmic 
cytoplasmic uh, ester related uh, condensate in plants. In this review, the authors some are uh, focused in three different ester related biomolecular condensate. That includes ester granules, biomolecular uh, processing body, and uh, serial metabolites. In the sixth one, using Kang and Tao Shun, uh, this card uh, reviewed the emerging role of n methyladenosine RNA modification in liquid phase separation of protein in plants. In the next one, Michel, Michel, Michel Talianski uh, discussed the evolutionary uh, conserved role of cacal body in the uh, regulation gene expression and uh, post-transcriptional post post uh, regulation. The last one, Shang Hit and collaborator uh, summarized the current uh, understanding of pyranoid function, uh, structure, and regulation in, in algae. Just as a reminder, a reminder that pyranoid is a biomolecular condensate uh, which has a, a role in carbon concentration in the chloroplast on the most of the algae. Now I'm going to focus this, the next slide to, to summarize the, rest of the research article that hasn't been published in the focus session. In the first one, Staffy and collaborators uh, make use of the physical principle of biomolecular condensate to design a tool book, a toolbox of uh, plasmids to study protein protein interaction and kinase activity in plants. The next one and the last one will be better explained later for the, by the author. So I'm going to, to focus in the next one, that is Nerea Ruiz Solano and, and author. In this paper, the, 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 the author show how arabidosin metacaspase number one is localized in stress granules and is required for the uh, clar clearance of uh, protein aggregation during stress. In the, in the next one, Chumi, Jin, and co-author uh, describe uh, how uh, arabidosin like protein undergo fast separation and in order to sequestrate DNA repay machinaria and promote the DNA damage response. The interaction between uh, condensate and membrane has been very well described in MAMA. However, this field or this, uh, this area of um, knowledge is, uh, is under study, study in plant. In the perpetual article, uh, Dra Dragwich and Van Damme uh, describe how membrane regulate the formation and function of membrane um, associated protein condensate in plants. The, the next, the uh, breakthrough report article will be explained later for the, uh, by, the, by the author. And finally, in, we, we are uh, published in the, in the focus issue two in brief articles, thus highlighted to study one of them from Shun Xin Lao et al. and another from Wang Jing Wang et al. that will be shown later. Now I want to finish my presentation with the uh, present uh, uh, with the presentation with the introduction of the moderator. The moderator corresponds to Sophie Henry. Sophie is a postdoctoral uh, researcher in the lab of Han Kuipers at the Has at Hassel University in Belgium. This is correct. Uh, I think so, <laughs> and she is uh, she is studying the redox, uh, redox process that is uh, appear in response to abiotic stress, and she is assistant feature editor in the Plant Cell. So, hello, Sophie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, okay. Thank you, Emilio. Uh, thank you, Emilio, Wait. for the nice introduction. Um, okay. So uh, also uh, welcome everyone on my behalf to today's webinar on biomolecular condensates. I am very excited to uh, moderate this webinar today as we have three very interesting uh, talks planned for you. Uh, before we get started with the first talk, I would like to point out to you that we have a Q&A box that you can find uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask to the speakers, you can just drop them in this box during or after the talk. And then after each talk, we will have a few minutes uh, for each of our speakers uh, to answer the questions. 
Um, so first of all, we will get started with our first speaker for today, um, who is uh, Pei Chen Li. He received a bachelor in biochemistry and a master in crop genetics and breeding from the Anhui Agricultural University in Hufei in China. He then completed his PhD in genetics at the Institute of Genetics and Developmental Biology in Beijing. And subsequently, he was a postdoc at the John Innes Center in Norwich in the UK from 2007 till 2015. Then he returned to Anhui Agricultural University, where he now works as a professor in the School of Life Sciences. And his work focuses on flowering time control and biotic and abiotic stress resistance. He has published more than 20 research articles in journals, including Nature Communications, Genes and Development, eLife, and of course, also in the plant cell. And today he will talk about us, uh, to us about his recently published plant cell paper, which is entitled the P-body component decapping five and the floral repressor sister or FCA regulate flowering locus C transcription in Arabidopsis. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today, Pei Jin. I'm really looking forward to your talk. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. For the introduction, I will share my screen. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Pei Jin Li, coming from China, Anhui Agricultural University. Uh, firstly, I would like to show my thanks to the Plant Cell for the organization of this event. Today, my talk is about the DKP5 and the front time of FRC and the uh, it's related gene sisters of FCA. So during my talk, there are three genes is very important. One is DKB5, another one is FLC, and last one is uh, sisters of FCA. In brief, is SSF. So why we uh, my talk will be divided into three parts. Firstly, is by the background. Why we are anal analyze uh, flying time? Because flying time on time is very essential. From this picture, you can see on the left side, you can see if the plant did not flower on time, uh, for, on, for on right time, they can grow normally and uh, produce seeds and uh, uh, finally produce enough seeds. But if they flower at the wrong time, for example, if they flower in winter, they cannot uh, produce grow normally and they cannot produce enough seeds. Actually, in agriculture, it is the same. Flower on time is very important for crops, for the seed yield. Uh, in the left side, you can see for abdopsis, if the plant from flower too early or too late, they can pro cannot produce enough seeds. They have to flower at the right time to, to produce a lot of seeds. For wheat, for example, in crop for, for wheat, it's a similar result. They have to flower at the right time that they can produce uh, optimal seeds. But the plant time is inflect, uh, regulated by many factors. For example, plant hormone, day length, ambient temperature, and a lot of species and the organization as well. And a lot of researchers have shown there are a lot of genes regulating flower time. Uh, at, at some people estimated there are about 500 genes regulate flower time. Among them, one of the genes is very important. We say is the FLC, flowering locks C. The FLC gene is a flower respirator. If the gene uh, plant level is very high, the plant cannot flower or they flower very, very late. And the FLC is regulated by many pathways, for example, autonomous pathway, organization pathway, epigenetics, and uh, uh, long, long coding RNA, for example, cooler. Previously, we want to identify the genes for flat time control. We use genome-wide association analysis we, to identify the components. We identified one gene is SSF, is the sisters of FCA. Uh, you can see the arrow pointed is the gene where it is located. We found SSF regulator uh, flower time and FLC at the transcriptional level. You can see if the gene is knockout, FLC level is low. And uh, you and in the 
uh, in the mutant, we found uh, when the gene is knocked out, RNA polymer, uh, polymer 2 accumulation level is downregulated. This indicates FLC is regulated at a gene transcriptional level. Uh, interestingly, the FLC, uh, the SSF in nature is divided into two alleles. For example, uh, one is N allele, another one is D allele. Interestingly, D allele is located in north of Sweden, and N allele is located in south of uh, Sweden. This is suggest this gene may be related to plant adaptation to the environment. But how SSF regulates the flowering time is not uh, clear. Uh, this is the reason why we, why we do this research. We found that in uh, overall, say, a cooperation between SSF and uh, TCP5. We use uh, uh, IPMS uh, use a uh, protein pull down method to identify the SSL interacting proteins. Actually, we identified uh, TCP5. How to make this? Okay, because I can see maybe on my screen. Uh, we identified TCP5 in the list of the SSL interactions. We validated this interaction by uh, firstly by East to hybrid. For example, we found SSF uh, uh, and TCP5, they coexist in the yeast. The yeast can grow, but for the controls, they cannot. We further uh, validated this interaction by split luck in tobacco leaves and uh, uh, BFC method in protoplast. And these two proteins that can co localize in nucleus, you can see these two proteins co localization. Uh, finally, we validated this interaction by two methods. One is a protein pull down, another one is a uh, co IP. Uh, another one is the co IP method. Uh, this result suggests that these two proteins can interact in vitro and in vivo. Uh, for the function, we, uh, we ordered one mutant, TCP5 mutant from, uh, uh, from Nazca. Uh, this is a TDN insertion in the three prime uh, UTR region. We found if we knock out the TCP5 gene, you can see the plant, uh, the plant flower is later and they produce uh, more, to, more leaf numbers than the Y type. And if we complement this mutant with uh, the native gene, we found the plant, uh, the plant flower at a similar level to the Columbia control. And uh, as an FLC level uh, is, is consistent with the plant time changes, you can see the plants that produce much higher FLC than the control and uh, the complementary line, uh, their FLC level is very similar to uh, Columbia, but very later than TCP5 mutant. And uh, very importantly, the unsubliced FLC, we say is nascent FLC, is consistent with the spliced FLC. It suggests uh, this TCP5 mutation may regulate uh, FLC at the transcriptional level. Uh, previously, a lot of the researchers, they, they uh, described that TCP5 existed in cytosol. But uh, just uh, you know, uh, two slides before, we found uh, they exist in nucleus and uh, co-localized with SSF. You can see uh, we think uh, this TCP5 may exist in nucleus as well. Uh, so we validated this prediction by DAP staining. You can see that this DAP staining and uh, TCP5 GLP localization they can overlap. So this suggests that TCP5 actually they also exist uh, in the uh, nuclear as well. And then we validated this result with the best bloating analysis. You can see in the cytosol and the nucleus, DCB5 uh, exists there. And then we use the uh, cheap experiment to check the PAL2 enrichment on FLC region. You can see when DCB5 is mutated, the enrichment, the PAL2 enrichment in the mutant is higher than the Columbia control. But in the complement line, you can see their level, uh, of, you know, uh, in the level is uh, reduced. Uh, is similar to Columbia. It means uh, this DCP5 regulated FLC level uh, through uh, via port to enrichment uh, and uh, at the trans trans transcriptional level. Uh, for the uh, analysis, to analysis the uh, relationship between DCP5 and SSF, we generated uh, the double mutant, SSF mutant and DCP5. You can see the plant, the flower uh, early, very similar to SSF, but uh, very different from DCP5. So these results suggest uh, this TCP5 function will rely on SSF. Uh, this is the total leaf number. It's consistent with the picture. 
And uh, for FRC as well, you can see FRC level of mutant is very similar to uh, SSF and different from TGP5. So genetically, we think uh, the SSF way uh, where functions on a uh, downstream of TCP5. Uh, for, to further prove this result, uh, we use the TCP5 overexpression uh, lines. You can see if TCP5 is overexpressed, they can see the like, early flowering and the FRC level is lower. But if we overexpress TCP5 in SSF mutant, you can see they cannot change the flowering time as well and as the uh, FRC level. It means that TCP5 function has to rely on SSF. So we, we found that TCP5, they can enrich on, uh, on FRC. But if we do this experiment in SSF background, you can see TCP5 GOP, uh, the enrichment is, uh, uh, is, is much, much lower. It means TCP5 enrichment on FRC rely on uh, SSF. So SSF is very important for TCP5 function. So we use a program to analyze this SSF. Uh, I try to analyze these molecular molecules. We found this gene have multiple uh, domains. One of the domains is the PRD. Uh, you know, this PRD is related to the uh, protein liquid liquid phase separation. So we think this uh, SSF gene uh, protein may have this. Uh, uh, characters. So we use SSF GLP, uh, you know, transgenic plants to check the SSF GLP phenom uh, the, uh, the, uh, the phenomenon. We found SSF GLP distribution in the nucleus is, uh, is, is irregular. But if you, we, uh, this irregular distribution is very different from uh, GLP control. You can see it's more or less very even. For the SPLD self, GLP also through multiple spots. But if you, we remove PRD from SSF, you can see uh, that distribution is very similar to SSF, but it's very different from, uh, very similar to GLP control, but very different from SSGLP. It means this protein uh, may, form the, uh, may, uh, may form liquid liquid separation. So in vitro, we, we expressed this protein and uh, added some PG in the solution. We found that they can form multiple droplets. But if we remove PRD, you can see the droplet uh, disappeared. And uh, interestingly, if we replace uh, PRD with FAS, you know, FAS is a, uh, uh, is a uh, PRD domain from another protein, they can, uh, the droplet is resumed. And if uh, we fuse SS with the they can, uh, they can they can shoot droplet as well. It means this protein in, droplet, in liquid, they can force uh, uh, separation. And this first separation is dynamic, is dynamics, dynamically. For example, you will photo bleach this uh, spot, they can recover to a certain level. Uh, for the droplet, you know, you will uh, photo bleach this uh, region, you can see their Florence signal uh, recovered very, very quickly. And this uh, smaller, uh, small uh, droplets, they can feed each other to form large ones. So this result is uh, uh, tell us, uh, you know, in vitro and in vitro SSF protein can form droplets. And uh, uh, UV and uh, functionally, you will remove the PRD from SSF. You can see the flower, the plant flower, the early is very similar to the uh, SSF, suggesting without the PRD, the, pro the protein is not functional. And a total different number of FLC, they should uh, consistent result. It means the SSF for phase separation is very, very important for its molecular function. And the PRD is very important for SSF enriching them on FLC. You, you see, if we remove PRD from the protein, the protein cannot reside on FLC anymore. So fast replacement, they can restore uh, uh, the SS function. You can see you we replace uh, PRD with fast. Uh, uh, their function uh, is, is recovered, is very, very similar to Columbia. So very, probably very different from uh, this SS mutant. It is suggested from another side, we say SSF, the first variation is very important for its function. And uh, the, the transgenic plants, they can, see, they can see the distribution is very, uh, this distribution is very similar to fast replaced uh, the construct. And uh, you know, similarly, TCP5, they also share these similar uh, patterns. For example, they have two PRD domains. 
and then for multiple stores, uh, stores you know, around the nuclei. And if you use uh, a photo bleach, this signal, you can see they can recover uh, very quickly. But uh, for the protein without PRD, DB5, they cannot form um, droplets and their fluorescence le uh, level cannot uh, recover, you know, maintain a very low level. And uh, similarly in vitro, you can see the similar result. They can form droplets and their signal can recover after photo bleach. This is a, a dynamic result. And if you, if you add salt in the solution, uh, the, the droplet can disappear as well. But they, and they are, you know, they're, they're the two smaller, uh, the droplets that can fill with each other, uh, similar to SSF findings. So uh, it's similar to SSF without PRD, the TCB5 has no function because it, uh, it, it's the flow time, the total leaf number is very similar to TCB5 mutant, but it's very different from the uh, Columbia control. It means the, the first separation character of SSF as TCB5 is very important for uh, its function. And uh, very interestingly, we want to analyze the TCP5 and SSF, what's their relationship with each other. If we add uh, TCP5, uh, you know, the protein in uh, SSF protein solutions, you can see they can form larger droplets. But if we add the TCP5 protein without the TLD domain, they cannot promote the size of the uh, SSF GOP. And this is a uh, quantitative analysis. And the SD, uh, HE, uh, you know, this gel shift experiment also tells the same result. You can see their shift is, uh, uh, you know, is very similar to the, uh, this, this is uh, very similar, is different from the uh, TCP5 with SSF, but without PRD, their shift is, is similar to uh, TCP5 itself. And in vivo, you know, TCP5 can promote, uh, okay, I don't know how to, okay. Uh, TCP, in vivo, uh, TCP5 can promote the size of uh, SSL uh, you know, signal as well. You can see this duplicate size is very, is much larger than uh, the control ones. This is a quantitative result. You can see the result. Uh, but in contrast, SSF cannot promote uh, uh, the first separation of TCP5, you can see their droplet size, they are, you know, is very similar. And in vivo, there are no difference between, no significant difference between uh, these two uh, constructs. For example, if you overpress uh, the SSF, you know, uh, you cannot see uh, uh, TCP5 fluorescence, the size is changing. If you analyze the TCP5 GOP in SSF mutant, their size is also very, very similar. It means this, uh, uh, promoting uh, of the cell size, the flowering size is uh, one direction, one direction. And the TCP5 promotes the uh, uh, SSF enrichment on FLC. For example, you can see SSF can enrich on FLC as previously we found. But if you uh, overweight press TCP5, you can see SSF enrichment on FLC is uh, upregulated. It means TCP5 can promote SSF GOP. Uh, uh, on FLC genomic region. And the, you know, for the first, first liberation, uh, we, uh, we did a similar result. You can see TCP5 flag can enrich, the, uh, enrich on FLC genomic region. But if we uh, analyze the result in SSL uh, background with the, you know, SSL without PRD, uh, the, you know, it means these plants, SSL cannot first liberate. So first liberate. You can see TCP5 cannot reside on FLC anymore. It means SS uh, uh, first separation is very important for FLC, uh, for TCP5 enrichment on FLC genomic region. So overall, we want to tell us a picture. This is a working model. For example, these two proteins, they can first separate, but they can interact and work together uh, to uh, share their influence on uh, FLC and flow time control. And this process is related is via, uh, is via uh, first separation. Uh, so overall, we, uh, some, to summarize, we, I want to tell you, we identify SSF, SSF is a flower inducer, and SSF can interact with TCP5, both of them affect the front time and FLC transcription. And SSF TCP5 will show uh, first, first separation uh, character, and uh, they, they are very important for their function. 
And in the end, the DTB5 is able to promote SSF condensation, which helps DTB5 and SSF complex to FLC genomic region. Uh, so in the end, I want to show my thanks to the uh, three uh, authors. Uh, and I want to show my great thanks to the reviews. They have helped us a lot to improve the uh, paper quality. Okay, thank you very much. Our questions and comments are welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Peichen, for a very uh, exciting talk, really interesting. Um, I noted that there are already some uh, questions that popped up uh, in the Q&A box, so I will read some of them to you. Um, first of all, um, an anonymous attendee uh, has a general question. He or she asks um, whether, yeah, so you saw that there is similar behavior with M cherry and GFP fusions regarding the liquid liquid phase uh, separation. And this person asks whether anything is known about different fluorescent protein tags having differential effects on liquid liquid phase separation. And whether, for example, there are differences with the threefold protein tags that we use for proteins that have lower expression levels. Okay, uh, I, I hope I got your questions. I get your questions. You know, uh, for the protein level, you know, if the protein level is very high, sometimes some people say that will influence the, uh, the convocal result. Actually, we use the uh, native promoter of the both genes. It means this uh, the protein level of this uh, construct, uh, the protein is very, is not very high. It's very similar to the native, uh, you know, the, the gene itself. So the protein level is not very high. Okay, thank you. And then there is a second question from Manuel Gonzalez, um, who asks whether cytosolic DP5 and P bodies are also somehow linked to the regulation of flowering. Uh, did you explore this or do you have an idea whether anything is known about it? Okay, I got this question. So yes, you're right. We uh, we uh, we know this uh, before because this uh, TP five exists in cytos and the nucleus. But uh, for uh, for plant control for FLC expression level regulation, we think uh, it is uh, uh, this function is mainly uh, I have to say in nucleus uh, because you we uh, analyze the result we found. Uh, the unsplicing FLC, the nascent FLC level is very similar. The changes is very similar to the spliced ones. It means uh, DCP5 regulated FLC mainly at the gene transcriptional level, uh, not in the cytosol. Actually, we cannot rule out this function. Maybe there are some uh, little function, you know, uh, some function in the cytosol have some influence, for example, on FLC, uh, say some, uh, some other ways. But uh, actually, we analyze the uh, FLC stability. It, uh, actually, we cannot see the difference for the uh, FLC stability. You know, uh, the, the stability is regulated in the, uh, you know, mainly in the cytosol. We think, you know, TCP5 regulated FLC is mainly in, uh, in, in the nucleus. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I see in the meantime, several more questions uh, popped up in the Q&A box, but I'm afraid that uh, in the interest of time, you will need to move on now to the next speaker. But um, Pei Jin, if you have time, it would be great if maybe you could uh, answer some of the questions directly in the Q&A box. Okay, um, okay, thank you. Yeah. So thank you very much again for this very interesting talk. Uh, so now we will move on to our uh, second speaker of today who is uh, Gisa Hoffmann. She performed her bachelor studies in Cologne in Germany, where she did her very first internship. And ever since then, she has been amazed by plant pathogens and their incredible sophistication. She continued working with plant pathogenic fungi during her masters in Vienna and Austria. And afterwards, she moved to Uppsala in Sweden to do her PhD during which she studied plant viruses and their translational regulation during infection. And to say it in Kisa's own words, studying viruses is especially exciting because they are masters of manipulation and give you a new perspective on what is biologically possible. Uh, recently, she started a postdoc in the group of Marco in Carbone at the Max Planck Institute in Potsdam, Germany, where she investigates uh, molecular barriers prohibiting viral transmission through the germline. And today, Gisa will talk uh, to us about her recent plant cell paper entitled 
cauliflower mosaic virus protein D6 is a multivalent node for RNA granule proteins and interferes with stress granule responses during plant infection. Uh, we look forward to your talk, Isa, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. This is working. Good. Thank you very much for the invitation and letting me speak about the latest paper. And I know the title seems a little bit convoluted, but we're going to go through it and you will see that it actually makes sense. But in the meantime, you can also call this um, project just stress and granules, which was our working title for the um, during the last years. So I want to start with a little bit of a broader introduction and tell you that Biomolecular condensates or RNA granules are a general target of viruses. And we have uh, in plants and also in animals, many examples of, for example, nuclear speckles, the nucleolus chihal bodies in the nucleus, or also in the cytoplasm, the stress granules and processing bodies that are targeted by different viruses. And there are several reasons for this. On the one hand, viruses really need to be able to change their environment quickly, and they will use anything they can find for this in a cell. And biomolecular condensates are one of these targets that will enable them to change the cellular environment quickly. On the other hand, these um, condensates are often implicated in translation. And this is really what it is all about for viruses. They need to get the upper hand in translation. So the nucleolus, you know, where the RNA DNA is sitting, is one of the prime targets for viruses. And today I want to talk mostly about the, cyto oops, the cytosolic um, RNA granules, mainly stress granules and processing bodies, and one specific virus belonging to the Colimoverida. Um, stress granules and processing bodies are normally implicated in translational repression, and we are interested in how do these structures respond to a virus infection, and especially how do they respond when the virus brings its own viral inclusion or bio-MC with it. So to show you a little bit with what we're working on, I'm working on cauliflower mosaic virus. It's the virus that brought you the 35S promoter. That is what it's mostly known for. Um, luckily for us, it infects our Rhodopsis. And I, I will show you here a little video of how this looks in our hands. On the left, we have a severe strain. On the right, we have a mild strain. We're using both. And when the plants first grow, you see no difference. The symptoms start to appear after about 10 days for the severe strain here, and after 14 days for the mild strain. And you can see the severe strain really attenuates growth completely, while the mild strain, it is still growing new leaves, but they're really tiny and close together. So it looks a little bit like a cauliflower, but of course the virus got its name um, from the plant where it was first discovered in, in the 30s, which was in a field in San Francisco in cauliflower. So normally we work with the plants when they're 20 days after infection, they're still quite happy, they maintain the infection well, but it's very systemic. So it's a great system to study these infections. And we don't just study cauliflower mosaic virus because it's so beautiful in Arabidopsis, but because it has a very exciting translation strategy, which makes it very unique. Because when we infect Arabidopsis with, um, with CAMV and we check the global translation, you can do this in these polysome profiles, where the higher the peak is, you will see the more ribosomes sit on an RNA. And as you go along the x-axis, the more ribosomes sit on an RNA. And in black, you see here a normal um, polysome profile in a Columbia plant that is already grown quite nicely. But when we infect with CAMV, you can see we raise the global translational level in the whole plant. This is something we normally never see, neither with plant viruses and especially not with animal viruses. But CAMV does this because its translation strategy involves um, something that is called translational transactivation. CAMV has to translate all its protein, its seven protein, from a single RNA. And each open reading frame on this RNA has a stop codon. But CAMV translates for a protein, which is called the P6 protein, or TUF, which sits back here. And this protein actually forces the ribosomes to stick on the RNA and continue translating after encountering a stop codon. This is how CAMV translates all its proteins. And it also does this for other proteins in the plant cell. And that's why we have this increase in polysomes. And P6 is so good at its job that even outside of an infection, if we just express the protein 
within a plant. So here in black, you have a Columbia plant with a high monosome peak and polysomes. When we express P6, you see a huge increase in polysomes. So even outside of the infection context, P6 increases translation in these plants. But P6 is an extremely multifunctional protein. It cannot only do this translational transactivation. It is also extremely promiscuous and interacts with all other viral proteins. It can bind RNA, DNA, and double-stranded RNA, and it builds the viral factories. If we just express P6 in a mock infection, it is normally quite soluble, and you see these little foci appearing that almost look like RNA granules in the cytoplasm. But when we infect the plant, what we see is these, these very large amorphous inclusions, and those are viral factories. This is where the virus makes its new particles. And what is interesting is that these viral factories bud off as very small um, inclusions, and then over the time they get bigger, and P6 will fuse together until in the very old infection, we basically have one very large inclusion in a cell. And these inclusions, are very rigid. So if we photobleach the areas, you can see that there's basically no protein coming back. So these inclusions are a very, very stable matrix. It's not liquid in that sense. Um, if we look a little bit closer into this, this is already a microtome from the 70s. You will see how it actually looks inside of these. So P6 matrix is everything that you see here in gray in this dense area. And inside here, you have these dark round spots. These are actually the viral particles that are packaged within the viral factories. And if you look around it, there is like a cloud of little black dots. And those are ribosomes that are attracted towards the viral factories to help the virus translate its proteins within the viral factories. So now we have this large inclusion in the cytoplasm. It contains RNA, DNA, and proteins, but also a lot of ribosomes. So it is technically a biomolecular condensate. There are no membranes involved in the building of this. But we are wondering, since the ribosomes are all there and stress granules and pea bodies normally do not want to be um, associated with translation because they are there to store RNA that are not associated with ribosomes, how will they react? And we started this project already a little bit before, first looking at processing bodies and then stress granules. And I just show you here a comic because we tested four different marker lines for each one of these and checked how do the markers behave during an infection, where are they localized? And interestingly, what we saw is that basically every marker we tested for either peabodies or stress granules is localized within the viral factories. That is actually all the markers we tested, except for DCP1. We don't know why, but it's included, excluded from the viral factories, but codes it. But interestingly, when we look at at least what looks like canonical RNA granules. We also find P6 in there. So it's very difficult to say, are these budding viral factories or are these bona fide RNA granules that contain P6? So how does this actually look when we look at it in a cell? Something like this. This is an RBP47B marker line, and you can see nicely here these large amorphous structures that are perfectly coated by P6. So these are the viral factories. But you can also see that there are several smaller um, foci here appearing, which could be stress granules. So we treated infected cells with cyclohexamide. It's a drug that normally leads to disassembly of stress granules. And when we do this, what you can see is that for RBP47B, the small foci, they really disappear, but the protein is still inside the viral factories. So either the drug cannot enter, the concentration is simply too high, or maybe it is actually not the RNA that keeps them there. So we thought, well, maybe if it's directly the interaction with P6, then those proteins are probably very stably bound in there. And if we frap them, they will also not disintegrate. So we did exactly this. And now I will take a little bit already the, the climax away here because you really need to check when we frap it, the protein is basically back directly. It is extremely mobile within these viral factories. And if we now frap the whole viral factory down here, you can see that it also directly comes back. So there's not only exchange of the proteins within the viral factory, but also between the factory and the outside. So whatever it is keeping them there is probably not bound to the rigid matrix, but moves freely within. Now, during our experiments, we found one 
um, exciting <laughs> facts, which is when we just tried, or when we looked at these marker lines that I'm showing you here, the double marker line with RBP47B and P6, we saw that when we tried to induce stress granules, so normally they appear after imminent stress, which you can um, induce, for example, through arsenide, then we can find nice stress granules. But if we try the same thing in the P6 transgenic lines, we have a hard time inducing stress granules. But now you can say, well, I already told you in the beginning that P6 lines have more translation. As long as there is enough translation, stress granules won't form. So of course you will have less. And I would say in the case of arsenide, this might even be true because we tested the overall translational profile. This is again, here you have the polysomes, you have the big monosome peak. After arsenide treatment, the polysomes are greatly decreased in the mock plant. But with the P6 plant, P6 is so strong that it still keeps the translation going. So we could argue in this case that the reduction in stress granules we see is because there's still a lot of translation going on. And what supports this notion is that we have a point mutation of P6, which you can see here, which is not able to transactivate anymore. And if we um, transform plants with this point mutation P6 and then induce stress granules again, you can see we don't see the same reduction that we see with the wild type P6. So maybe it is this, but now comes the kicker. We wanted to stress the, um, the system a little bit more and use the harsher stress than arsenide treatment. So we used heat treatment and heat treatment is really strong. So if we do this, all polysomes disassemble and it doesn't matter if it is in a, um, in a Columbia plant or in a single expressor for just stress granules or with P6, P6 cannot hold them. So we would think if this is the case, then the stress granules should go back up again to the normal level, but they don't. So in three out of four lines that we tested, we still saw the same reduction in stress granules, even though this cannot be directly linked to translational levels. So our hypothesis right now is that there is a second independent mechanism that um, P6 can induce that is translation independent to reduce stress granule amounts. But of course, the question is, why would the, the virus do it? Do stress granules have an antiviral function? Does the virus need um, to keep them away? So we're going back to the infection context. And first, we just tested mutants. So there, unfortunately, there is no good complete knockout system for stress granules. But we tested the whole RBP47 um, family with its nine members and one triple mutant. And we saw there is not a big difference in virus accumulation in these plants. The virus is fine, but this would also make sense when it anyway um, gets rid of the stress granules in its way. So we thought, okay, how about we push the system in the other way and we force the virus to really interact with these stress granules by overexpressing them. Well, first, Arabidopsis doesn't really appreciate having stress granules or constitutive stress granules, especially here when you see RBP 45C, the plant starts to show autoimmune phenotypes. But who appreciates this even less is CAMV. Because when I try to infect these plants, I really had a hard time. Normally with Columbia, we have about 90% infection success. When I try the same thing with RBP45C, for example, it drops down to about 40%. And the plants that I do manage to infect, the, the virus is really reduced in there. So we're thinking right now, CAMV really takes away the stress granules through P6 to avoid them during infection because they're antiviral. So to sum this up, P6 is extremely promiscuous, and we think it likes to associate with RNA granule proteins. In general, they are also promiscuous. Both of them can bind RNA. As long as P6 is very soluble, so in fresh infections, it is very strong in inhibiting um, stress granule formation, and this is somehow linked to the transactivation or the translational modifications that it does. But as time goes on and these viral factories grow, P6 is a multivalent node, so it binds everything together, and these viral factories really are a melting pot for several different pathways. But the more P6 condenses into these very large structures, the less it is possible for this protein to interfere with stress granule responses. And we think this is actually something the virus 
um, tries to achieve because it's a self attenuation process. When it first goes into a cell, it really wants to start translating and be basically kept in, in peace. So it tries to circumvent the stress granules. But as time goes on, it wants the stress granules to reappear because this will lead to more survival of the plant and a longer infection cycle, which then will benefit the virus again. At least this is our model for now. There are still many open questions. Um, I think it would be great to try to really see what kind of proteins and RNA are inside these viral factories. And this is a, um, a direction that we're going in or that my, my lab is going in now. So this just leaves me to thank the people who made all of this possible, especially Anders, uh, my PhD supervisor, who was really a, a great help and enabled me to do all this work, and our great collaborations in, in UMIA. They did all the translational work um, with the group of Johannes Hansson and especially the postdoc Amir. I would also like to thank the funding and, of course, the plant cell for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And... Um, I can just say Sweden was a great place to do a PhD, and this paper is a little bit homage to the to Scandinavia. So the color code of the figures is actually um, derived from the um, from the flags of Scandinavia. But I was told it's a little bit too subtle and nobody will know it is. So I thought I'll tell you now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gisa. Super interesting uh, presentation, and I really liked the color coding. I indeed didn't. <laughs> but nice that you mentioned. Um, in the meantime, uh, some people have already asked some questions uh, in the Q&A box, uh, so I will read some of them to you. Um, mm -hmm. So the first one is from Vadim Volkov, who asks uh, whether you have also studied the role of the cytoskeleton in the reactions to P6 expression. Mm -hmm. No, we haven't. I can, I can, no, we didn't yet. Um, but cytoskeleton is something that is popping up more and more now. Um, we also did one GWAS screen with CAMV and there the cytoskeleton was one of the main hits. So it's something we definitely have to look into. Um, what I can say is that the viral factories, when they, when they grow, they will go closer to the nucleus and they start to incorporate ER. So I think, I mean, they definitely do take some structures from, from the plant and I guess cytoskeleton will be in there too, yes. Okay, very interesting. Um, then the next question is from uh, Manuel Gonzalez, and he asks whether a P6 mediated induction of translation also represses uh, PBs similar to arsenide induced stress granules. Yes, no, it doesn't. <laughs> so there is no reduction in processing bodies when you express P6, and we think that somehow the virus is able to select a little bit to suppress stress granules, but actually increase P bodies because we found the P bodies actually help the virus in its translation. Okay, um, and then maybe a final uh, question for now. So it's uh, a question from Maju Vajaj, if I say it correctly. Um, who asks whether a uh, polysome accumulation uh, is reduced in abiotic stress as you observed in the case of heat treatment? Um, so we, the only abiotic stress we used is heat treatment in that mm -hmm. case or arsenide. Yeah. Both of these stresses lead to reduction of polysomes. Um, other people have also used cold treatment or submergents. And all of these stresses first lead to polysome disassemble because I think the cells want to, once they restart, they will change their, their translational profiles. Um, so a lot of different abiotic stresses lead to polysome disassembly. Okay, thank you very much for uh, your nice talk again and for answering some of the questions uh, of the participants. I see that some more questions are appearing, so maybe you can also uh, answer them uh, by typing the answers in the Q&A box. Um, so then we will move on to our uh, final speaker for today. Um, and this is uh, Justin Lau. Uh, Justin is originally from Hong Kong, and he performed his undergraduate at the University of Sheffield in the UK, where he worked on the enzyme kinetics of key C4 enzymes uh, in Richard Leakett's group. And during that time, he cultivated an interest in CO2 concentrating mechanisms. 
Uh, currently, he is a PhD student in Luke McInerney's lab at the University of York in the UK, and he studies CO2 concentrating mechanisms in algae. Um, he uses a combination of biochemistry, genetics, and microscopy to investigate the biogenesis of the liquid-liquid phase uh, separated pyranoids. And today, Justin will uh, present his uh, recently published uh, paper in Plant Cell, which is entitled a phase separated CO2 fixing pyranoid proteome derived by Turbo ID in Chlaminomonas. Um, so we look forward to your talk. Uh, so the floor is yours, Justin. Um. At Agisa, I think you still need to stop sharing your screen in order uh, for Justin to be able to share his screen. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, sorry. No worries. Thank you. Right. Hi, everyone. I'm Justin. It's really excited. And thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, some of the work I've done for my PhD at York, which involves using a powerful technique called proximity labeling to understand a composition of the face separated organelle called pyranoid in the green algal model species Chlamydomonas reinhardtii. So just a bit of background. Um, CO2, uh, diffusion of CO2 in water medium is much lower in water than in air. So what that means is photosynthesis, and particularly uh, carbon fixation by the rubiscos, is highly limited by this uh, slow diffusion. And so eukaryotic um, photosynthetic aquatic organisms like algae, um, they have to evolve uh, different strategies to combat this limitation. So for algae, they evolved a CO2 concentrating mechanisms to efficiently deliver CO2 by condensing rubiscos into microcompartments and supplying CO2 directly to this dedicated site, which increases CO2 surrounding rubisco and also removing photorespiration, which is one of the energetically wasteful process which limits, photo uh, which limits photosynthesis. So in cyanobacteria, this uh, CO2 concentrating mechanisms takes the form of carboxysomes, which are proteinated shells which surround the condensed uh, rubisco. While in, while in eukaryotic algae, which is the topic of my talk today, which they use is something called the pyranoid, which is a liquid liquid phase separated organelle where rubiscos are um, phase separated. And this organelle is highly prevalent in, al in algae and, and it's actually virtually found in all algal lineages. And for today, I'd like to focus on the green algal model species, Clamonomonas reinhardtii, which is most of our understanding of pyranoid based CCM comes from. In Clamonomonas, the pyranoid is composed of three separate layers. We have a pyranoid tubules, which, um, uh, sorry. We have a pyranoid tubules, which are thylakot membranes that traverses the pyranoid and live delivering CO2 to the pyranoid matrix, and a matrix which are composed of the aforementioned condensed rubisco, and also a starch sheath, which are starch granules shaped as cups surrounding the pyranoid matrix, which prevents leakage of CO2. We know that in uh, Chlamydomonas, the pyranoid is formed by the interaction between rubisco holoenzymes and a linker protein called HPIC1 where they use this small uh, rubisco interacting motif, linking multiple copies of rubiscos together and driving a multifilar interactions of rubisco, therefore uh, um, generating the phase separations of rubisco and forming the pyranot matrix. And it's precisely because this multivalent um, nature of pyranoid and their dynamic behavior makes it really difficult to understand their composition using very conventional approach such as organelle purification or affinity purification coupled with mass spectrometry. But understanding the composition is integral to understanding some outstanding uh, questions which are important for CCM engineering and higher plans. For example, what controls the deficiency of pyranoid and how are different structural components such as thylakoid tubules and starch um, uh, sheath are assembled around the pyranoid matrix. So to combat um, these difficulties and try to understand the composition, we look towards using a technique called proximity labeling using Turbo ID. So Turbo ID is a biotin ligase, which is capable of turning biotin and ATP into short-lived biotin radicals. 
These radicals diffuse rapidly from the site of generation and has a diffusion radius of about 40 nanometers. When these radicals hit a, um, um, a neighboring proteins within this radius, they spontaneously bartinellate these um, proteins on the lysine or histidine residues and generating a biotin tag on them. By exploiting the interaction between biotin and streptavidin, we can easily purify these um, uh, biotin-related proteins and therefore uh, submitting them for um, LC-MS-MS analysis to understand what the identity is. So to target um, the pyranoid matrix, we chosen Rubisco small subunit as a proof of concept B in hopes that by introducing Rubisco tag to the turbo ID tag, we can target um, the turbo ID into the pyranoid matrix and bartinellate all neighboring proteins within the pyranoid, identifying new proteins in the start sheaf as well as the pyranoid tubules. So we went through a few um, proof of concept and pilot testing. What we first done is express a Rubisco turbo ID attached with an M cherry fluorophore. And using confocal imaging, we found that the express protein localizes as a puncture, shown here in green, that's surrounded by the magenta chlorophyll um, signals, which shows the canonical locations of the pyrenoid. So knowing that it does, um, the turbo ID does not perturb localization of the pyrenoid uh, of the Rubisco protein, we then try to block for wholesale lysate and look at bartinellation activity. To do so, we incubated wild type and also Rubisco turbo ID expressing lines and um, exogenously added biotin substrate to the cell culture and using the wholesale lysate using streptavidin to profile biotin later proteins using Western blot. And here we can show that additions of biotin substrate elicit strong biotinylation signals in the Rubisco turbo ID expressing line, but not so for the wild type background. So knowing that we can activate the biotinylation by the additions of biotin substrate, we then move on and seeing and, and, just, and um, investigate whether increasing biotin concentration can generate at different kinds of activity. And we can see that, and we can see here that increasing amount of biotin concentration used generate a more stronger biotinylation, which allow us to optimize on the condition we use. And using this high amount of biotin concentration, we further looked at um, the um, temporal resolutions of this method and show that there's high amount of bartinellation observed within the first hour of incubations of Rubisco turbo ID line within with the biotin substrate, showing that um, activity within first hour could possibly be captured by this method. So knowing that the Rubisco tag of turbo ID localizes to the pyrenoid and can be activated by biotin substrate, as a quick response time, we've submitted the streptavidin purified proteins to mass spectrometry. So here is a summary of that result. So on the x-axis, we're showing the log 2 fold change comparing protein abundance um, coming from the Rubisco turbo ID tagged protein uh, tagged lines um, against wild type background. And on the y-axis, we showed the statistical significance. So the first thing we've done is to um, create a, is to curate proteins with known localizations comes from um, fluorescence protein tagging and using them as benchmark. And we highlighted proteins which are localized to the pyrenoid in blue and those in those are not going to the pyrenoid in yellow. Using them, we've been able to generate true and false discovery rate, which allows us to highlight um, and determine the enrichment threshold, which we can call um, portions of protein being significantly enriched on the right-hand side of the panel, colored in blue. So really encouragingly, what we found is that pyrinot proteins represented here in some examples are mostly located on this right panel of, the of this figure. So those such as the linker protein and rubiscos, as well as the um, uh, phylicoid localized proteins within the pyrinoid. But for those keen eye, you might see that some of the pyrinot proteins are actually located here. And what, what's more encouragingly, we found that actually these pyrinot localized proteins are often found within the thylakoid lumen or actually outside of the pyrinot matrix, which are places which are um, not likely to be bartinellated by the matrix localized um, turbo ID tag, which shows that the turbo ID generated biotin signals actually are highly location um, specific. 
So to dig a little deeper and um, look more detail into our data, we split non-localized, non-purinot localized protein into further classifications, including those going to the chlorophastroma or those in both the purinot and chlorophastroma. And also along how, also um, on how long the rubisco terbide incubated lines have been incubated with biotin substrate um, for one, two, four, and eight hours. And what we can see here is that for um, rubisco terbide um, generated biotin lation, um, we found that proteins show, that are localized with the chlorophastromas shown to be increased in biotin lation, but this is true for not only purinoid localized protein, but also for chloroplastroma and also purinoid and stromal proteins, which suggests that there are some leaky bartonylation. So what we wanted to do is to improve the resolutions of our um, approach. So to do so, we've introduced two more chloroplastromal controls by tagging Calvin cycle enzyme RP1 and PRK1. And here again, we're showing using um, cherry fluorescence protein tagging these proteins localize to the chlorophastroma, so they overlap with chlorophyll signals, but then are um, exclude, excluded from the pronot matrix, which are where the rubisco and turbo ID localizes. So using them as a spatial benchmark, we compared their biotinylation rather than using wild type. And again, we can show that there's a consistent enrichment on pronot targets using the stromal control groups, and they perform much better than the wild type comparison where they include multiple background proteins in the um, enrichment threshold. So satisfied with this, we use, multi we use these uh, stromal control backgrounds to generate a pyrinot proxiome including 84 proteins and further highlighted 30 uh, proteins which we termed high confidence pyrinot proxiome by only considering those proteins that are found in multiple pyrinot um, and stromal comparisons. These 30 proteins include over half of them which are previously localized to pyrinoid, which again highlight the pow power of this approach. To further validate our data, we use fluorescence protein tagging and highlighted and tagged seven previously uncharacterized protein and show that six of these proteins localizes to the pyrinoid which shows a diverse localization into different pyrinot subcompartments and also different functional annotations, including sulfur redox metabolism, pyrinot tubules related, starch binding, and even translation related uh, proteins. And one of the proteins within our, um, our um, uh, pyrinot proxium, which I named PINS2, shows, so it shows a starch binding domain followed by a coil coil um, prediction shows very interesting localizations where it localizes to the starch sheath edge where thylakoid tubules enter the pyrinot matrix, which could suggest that these proteins are important for thylakoid um, pyrinot tubules entry into the pyrinot matrix. Using a CRISPR-Cas9 mediated method, we generated multiple knockouts of this gene, and we grow the um, knockouts as well as wild type into different conditions, um, in high, low, and very low CO2. And we show that this mutant actually grows poorly under low and very low CO2, where CCM is important to its growth, and therefore highlighting that this protein might be responsible for CCM function. And this again highlights the power of this approach in highlighting a functionally important proteins that can participate in CCM. So knowing that using proximity labeling, we can generate a high confidence composition of a phase separated um, compartment, we want to further push this method into understanding what other compositional change during environmental response. So it is very well known that in high CO2, pyrinot matrix partially dissolved and the starch morphology changes massively in uh, where the star sheafer no longer exists or is very minimal. While in low CO2, the pyrinot matrix formed recruiting almost all of the uh, all of the rubisco within the cell and there will be no starch um, in the chloroplastroma, and a majority of the starch um, is surrounding the pyrinot matrix. So to test whether we can see the compositional change, we incubated rubisco turbo ID cells under high CO2 supplemented growth and also low CO2 supplemented growth. And we carried out streptophylline purification on these lines as well and compare the enrichment. Again, we're showing a volcano plot of this results and those on the right are enriched by low CO2 incubation and that on the left enriched by high CO2 in, uh, uh, incubation. 
And surprisingly, we found that majority of the purinot proteins we found are not CO2 responsive. And this includes previously determined purinot proteins, as well as those will be determined in this study. However, ones that are showed low CO2 enrichment, for example, LCI9, um, SAGA1, and also AMA3, they are, which are often associated with starch or starch binding domain, um, are high, are, do show to be low CO2 um, induced and are enriched by low CO2 incubated cell lines. So these still echoes the high to low CO2 transition and suggest that perhaps the purinot matrix compositions are relatively unchanged in high and low CO2 um, condition. So knowing that, so in summary, what we've done is established the Turbo ID method in Clamidomonas, generated a high confidence proxy aim of a dynamic compartment. We also validated new pyrinot components, which are important for CCM functioning. And we just wanted to highlight at the end that all the strains and uh, factors we've used is more compatible and we've deposited in the Clamidomonas Resource Center, which is available for community usage. And finally, I'd like to thank my supervisor, Luke and Gavin, some of my wonderful lab mates, which without them would not be possible for this work. And also like to thank my funders, Will and Melinda Gates a Foundation, as well as University of York. And thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Justin. It was a super interesting talk, really nice uh, method. And I think it would be really useful for many people in this uh, research field. Um, so we will proceed with some questions. I already saw one appear in the Q&A box, um, which is a question. Wait, where is it? Ah, the question is now gone, I think. Um, so we will proceed with another one. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think I think I might have I think I might have clicked that off, but it was um to talk about whether we can isolate pyrenoids by centrifugation yep, and yep. that. And that has previously been done um, before. And but the problem with this technique is you all often um, would be able to purify other cell compartments along with it, such as thylakoid proteins and also any other associated proteins that come up that is very highly abundant. But the power of this technique is that um, by comparing um, and using these kind of spatial control that are also tagged with Turbo ID, we can escape these um, um, un unnecessary structural components because we go through very stringent chemical washes. Yeah, indeed. So I think your uh, new technique could be really interesting as, as an alternative and, and an improved uh, version of this indeed. Um, so then there is another uh, question that popped up. So um, Alquila, who is Sola, asks, um, you found proteins related to protein translation. I wonder if you have any ideas on the role of uh, paranoid and chloroplast protein translation. So um, I think there is quite a lot of work that uh, has um, been published previously by uh, William Surges' group on um, protein translation. Uh, on chloroplast protein translation, and they found that um, thylakoid membranes are very close to the pyrenoid, uh, which they've called translation zones, uh, where um, a lot of photosynthetic components are being synthesized. So there's obviously a link of pyrenoid and protein translation, but there's no bona fide evidence that show pyrenoid is participating in translation at the moment. Wow. Okay, very interesting. Um, and then I see um, another question uh, popping up here in the Q&A box. Uh, so uh, someone asks whether it is established that the pyrenoid is composed of two components only. So um, I think this is, this is really interesting because we know that the matrix, which is um, most of it is composed of Rubisco is highlighted by, uh, which is made by the Rubisco enzymes and linker protein. But, Similar to what I've been showing earlier, there's obviously more, there's much more components that goes into pyrenoid that makes it up. However, for CCM functioning, perhaps it might only need Rubisco on, on its own. So, de so definitely there is more than two components to the pyrenoid, like what I've been showing, and also a lot of um, other groups have also shown before. Okay. And maybe a final question to conclude. Um, so Anya asks, um, do you know if Turbo ID can be used to quantify ratio of proteins in a certain sample or only whether they are there or not? Um, because it would be very interesting to establish relative protein abundances. Mm, I 
So the the limitations of Turbo ID, which we always have to keep in mind, is that the generation of biotin radicals are limited by how much biotins are going into the cell, and also um, whether the proteins itself, which have been tagged, whether they have surface exposed lysine, which are these biotin radicals attach points. So if they have relatively less amount of, um, of these lysines, they are not likely to be uh, biotinylated. So for an absolute quantification um, 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 perspective, I think that wouldn't be the most useful. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, so I think that were the only questions uh, for now. So then I would like to uh, conclude by thanking all of our uh, speakers again for their wonderful uh, talks. I definitely learned a lot. Um, and of course, I also want to thank all of our participants for joining us here today for this webinar. And then uh, finally, I would like to uh, give the word back to uh, Emilio. Hey everybody, yes, uh, I just I want to, to thank to everybody just for attending. The speaker for this nice talk, I'm really interesting. And the, of course, uh, Sophie for to moderate the, 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 the webinar. Yes, uh, it's all. So see you Great. in the next. <laughs> yes, and, and, and the next one is September 25th. It's a plant physiology uh, focus issue on cell polarity. And you should be seeing an email coming out um, sometime in the next couple of days. So thank you, everyone. Um, wonderful, wonderful talks. I really, really enjoyed those. See you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.